Greetings to our esteemed guest, members of our diplomatic community and friends from around the world. Welcome to the April installment of A Seat at the Table, Women in Global Leadership Series. My name is Maureen Pace, and I am the CEO of the World Trade Center Dublin, Ireland, and also serve as Vice President of the Drew Company. This program and series we present to you has been inspired by author Susan Sloan and her book, A Seat at the Table, Women, Diplomacy, and Lessons for the World. Her book has been written for aspiring women leaders. In it, she shares lessons and experiences from, from dynamic principles on how to succeed, not only in the diplomatic sphere, but also in life. We are so pleased to have her as our program moderator today and throughout this series. Our program is designed to bring unique perspectives and experiences from former and current ambassadors, dignitaries, and global leaders who have made an impact in their respective careers and areas of expertise. Today, Susan will lead a conversation with Ambassador Capricia Marshall, an American diplomat, author, and bridge builder, who will discuss her new book, Protocol, The Art of Diplomacy and How to Make It Work for You. Before we get started, I'd like to extend my gratitude to our team and company for inviting me to open this program and series. I'm honored to be one of the many female executives at our parent company, The Drew Company, and I'm pleased to be here representing the World Trade Center Dublin, Ireland, in partnership with the World Trade Center Washington, D.C. The World Trade Center Washington, D.C. is the trade programming arm of the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center. For over 20 years, our company, TCMN, has proudly served as the exclusive manager of the Reagan Building through a unique public-private partnership with the U.S. General Services Administration. Together, we have developed the Reagan Building into a hub for government, business, global commerce, and cultural exchange. I want to extend a special thank you to our partners, the Associates of the American Foreign Services Worldwide, the Azar Foundation for Children of the World, Howard University School of Business, and the Women's Business Collaborative, Thank you, we value your continued participation. Now, it is my pleasure to formally introduce our moderator for today's program, Ms. Susan Sloan. In addition to authoring A Seat at the Table, Women, Diplomacy and Lessons for the World, Susan has met with more than 60 countries through diplomacy, advocacy and experiential education. At the age of only 30, she completed a life goal of visiting all seven continents. Susan holds a master's degree in global strategic communications from Georgetown University and graduated, as no surprise, magna cum laude. We thank you all again for joining us this morning and hope that you enjoy what I am certain will be a lively conversation. So without further ado, I turn it over to you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Great to see you and great to see all of our viewers today. I'm Susan Sloan and you have a seat at the table. We're glad you could join us. So no matter where you are, maybe you're at your desk, your kitchen table, your couch, maybe a patio, maybe a few of you are holding your children in your laps, or maybe you're making lunch right now. First things first, you made it, you're here. A special thank you to the Reagan Building, of course, the World Training Center in Washington, D.C. in Dublin and TCMA for creating this special series, A Seat at the Table, Women in Global Leadership. There are many people behind the scenes right now, even, even now, you don't even know they're behind the curtain, that make this possible. So you know who you are and thank you. This series is based on my book, A Seat at the Table, Women, Diplomacy and Lessons for the World. I did 30 interviews spanning the globe uh, with varying styles of leadership from all these different amazing leaders. Women from Afghanistan, Albania, Australia, Bulgaria, Croatia, Denmark, Finland, France, Hungary, Iceland, Kosovo, Kurdistan, North Macedonia, Mexico, Namibia, Singapore, Sweden, and the US. So why did I do this? The whole plan was to show not only why is it important to have a seat at the table for women, but also why gender parity, equity, and equality brings better solutions for the world. A little background, foreign policy research states that companies with the highest percentage of women in management are 47% more profitable than the lowest. And if you're looking at 
government institutions, participation of civil society groups, including women's organizations, make a peace agreement 64% less likely to fail. With countries facing challenges of pandemics, migration, terrorism, climate change, and the spread of fast-paced technology, who is around the table matters. In a business case, we all know it cannot solve gender diversity. It's more personal. And we need these personal stories to understand why it's important and what we can do to change the system. So this series, you'll hear from global leaders who have a seat at the table. And yes, don't worry if you can't be here for the whole time, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on YouTube at the Ronald Reagan Building YouTube channel about a week after the program. So tune in about a week later. And friends, this is a live program right now. So if you submit questions in the Q&A, I will ask them. So please put all of your questions in the Q&A. The, the more, the better. We are also, of course, online. So share your comments and other questions with the hashtag seat at the table or the hashtag where leaders lead. You can tweet at us, you can Instagram us, you, whatever you wanna do. There's two different handles I want you to look at, at Reagan ITCDC and at Real Susan Sloan. And now it is my pleasure to tell you about our distinguished guest, Ambassador Capricia Marshall. Capricia Marshall is the president of Global Engagement Strategies, which advises international, public, and private clients on issues relating to the nexus of business and cultural diplomacy. So you're in for a real treat. Her clients include Fortune 100 companies. So this is the person you definitely want to hear from. Also, Elle Magazine named her as one of DC's most influential women in the annual Washington Power List. She's the author of Protocol, The Power of Diplomacy and How to Make It Work for You. I will let you know that I have this book with me right now. And you can see I have marked all of the important parts, which is basically every part of the book. If you don't have this book, you need to get it. Anyone who wants to be empowered by the tools of diplomacy and work in everyday life, this is the guide to do it. So let me tell you a little bit about her before we jump in. She's a first generation American of Croatian and Mexican, Mexican descent. She brings an understanding of the importance of culture and protocol to all of her posts. And she's currently ambassador in residence at the Atlantic Council in Washington, DC. She served as the White House Social Secretary in the Clinton administration and the United States Chief of Protocol in the Obama administration. She enhanced these traditional protocol methods with new tools and built relationships between dignitaries and industry leaders worldwide. And in her book, you learn about all of her travels, so it really happened worldwide. And in 2013, the Secretary of State awarded her the Distinguished Service Award and she received the Order of the Cross of Isabel La Catlica from the Ambassador of Spain. Capricia, welcome to A Seat at the Table, Women in Global Leadership. Oh, wow, what an introduction. Susan, I'm gonna package you and take you everywhere with me. I think I, I, think I might just take this recording with me everywhere. And when I'm feeling a little low, I'm just gonna play you. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you. Thank you so very much. Uh, for inviting me to take a seat at the table. Fabulous book right back at you. And I have to say to everybody, if you don't have it, you got to get it. Um, I am uh, also so incredibly um, honored to have been invited uh, by Maureen, uh, the wonderful president of the World Trade Center in Dublin. She's just fabulous, as you've just seen, just a, a, a tremendous asset. Um, and uh, I want to extend a, a great deal of thanks also to Allison, uh, the Associate Director of the WTC in Washington, DC. She and my good, good, wonderful, fabulous friend, John Duplain, who has amazing panache um, and has been just a, 
a great friend for so many years, both of them. I've known them now for, for years and years throughout the time that I served as chief and, and all the way till, of course, today. Um, she as embassy liaison, every ambassador knows Jen. Um, she has, she runs wonderful programming here in Washington, DC, that if you don't go, you're not in the know. And uh, I'm just deeply grateful to all of them for inviting me to be a part of uh, this wonderful series and for taking a seat at the table, Susan. Well, we're happy to have you, of course. And I will start the conversation, a little bit of background about you. Now you mentioned in your book that we're all interested in origin stories. So of course, I have to ask you, Tell us about your background growing up in a multicultural family and how did your childhood prepare you for your work in protocol and diplomacy? You know, of course, I didn't know at the time that um, growing up in my grandmother's home, which was half of a duplex, um, you know, itsy bitsy little house where there was um, so many cultures celebrated, so many different languages spoken. Um, as you mentioned, my my mother, and this was my maternal grandmother's home, uh, but we, you know, Mexicans, so there's lots of Spanish being spoken, and my father, um, Croatian, and uh, we had relatives that were Polish and Italian, and our neighbors were Lebanese and Russian, and I mean, there just was, the house was constantly full of people from every corner of the globe. And best of all, of course, was that there were just so many different types of food being served. So it, it became a part of my core. And um, what I identified with, what I felt comfortable, I felt so comfortable in that environment. So I could not have been more excited, pleased that Secretary Clinton suggested to President Obama that he put my name forth as his chief of protocol to represent him in that post. And um, when he did, I, I didn't know him very well, but you know, I want to say that he kind of grew to love me. Um, even of course though I was, he did, of course he did. <laughs> even though I was constantly telling him what to do. But I have to tell you, Susan, once I raised my hand, took the oath of office and began to engage with the extraordinary foreign diplomatic corps and, and then traveling with the president to every country, literally he and I were attached at the hip. Um, I felt like I returned right back home to my grandma's kitchen. It just, uh, it felt like this is what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to embrace these cultures. I'm supposed to help our government official, officials at the highest levels understand these cultures, um, bridge the cultural divides. It was, it was a wonderful challenge and uh, one that um, I, I think that I, I shall never live up to uh, the time that I spent uh, in that office at the State Department again in my career. Well. When you stepped into this position of chief of protocol, you called your predecessors for guidance and you talk about this in your book. I'm curious, what were the differences between the men and the women who served in these roles? And could you see a difference in style from what they told you based on their gender? Hmm. That's a really interesting question, Susan. I, you know, I was privileged in the sense that I had served in a previous administration. So I understood the operations of government, um, you know, sort of how it could slog along or how you could sort of move those wheels a little faster. I understood the interface between the White House and the agencies and also the pecking order at the White House. So I knew who to liaison with. I understood um, how I could sort of maneuver around some of the, um, the barriers that were put in place. So for me, getting into the poke, understanding the function of government when I got into the post was, um, I think I had a leg up. What I needed help with then, of course, was understanding fully what was expected of me in this position? What had my, my predecessors um, done with success? What didn't work? And, and I talk about this in a way in the book, like it's, it's called beginner's mindset. Even though I had had vast experience of working in the government, I wanted to walk in with fresh eyes. I wanted to understand 
um, you know, how they made the position work for their president. And so uh, I went to each of them, spoke to them individually, and, and, and really did pull the best of the best out of. Each of them gave me a great nugget that I could take and expand upon and make a part of the office in an official capacity. Um, now you ask about gender difference, which is quite interesting because um, the, the, there, were, there are several, well, most chiefs of protocol uh, prior to Lucky Roosevelt, really, who served in the Reagan administration were men. Um, Shirley Temple Black, which many people don't know, the fabulous actress, uh, was the first uh, female chief of protocol. Right, and right, so, yeah. um, you know, it, 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 each of them brings something very uh, different. And so most of my predecessors were actually women. Uh, but I did talk to both, and um, and I and I had full on conversations of what they what they they found work and what didn't. And you know, I would have to say Lloyd, who's one of my great mentors, I, I just an, an ex Lloyd Hand, just an extraordinary uh, chief. He served President Johnson. He had a very personal relationship with President Johnson, so it was very nuts and bolts. He would tell me, "Just Capricia, you have to get in there and you have to make sure that uh, these ambassadors meet the president." And I was like, hmm, okay, I will take that to heart. But he meant that in, a way, in whatever way I could. And so I used opportunities like credentialing ceremonies and, and the like to really bring the ambassadors in and, and try to uh, make a connection uh, with the president himself. I mean, he was the one who was affirming their credentials. Right. The, the um, I would say more in line with the women um, who served in this post, I think like women in general, we, we are, we're bridge builders. We want people to really connect with one another, understand one another. And so the programming that was put in place by like Ambassador Brinker, Experience America, I love that program. It meant let's take these ambassadors out into the United States, out beyond the beltway here in Washington, DC, and give them a real taste of our diversity, who we are in America what we stand for and how you know, we've adopted a bit of their cultures into our own, that we are this magnificent quilt of difference. And, um, and the program was fantastic. And it's still going on today. I um, expanded it and then made it a part of the official budget because if it's not a part of the official budget, it, it ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. Exactly. So there's, there's I, I think, minor differences, but the the position of chief of protocol really was incumbent upon um, all of us to uh, understand the foreign policy objectives of our president and to create a foundation for diplomacy and then implement it. Mm. Um, and then pretend like we weren't even there. Behind the scenes, behind the scenes. Yes. Always behind the scenes. Well, I'm curious. We have a question from the audience right now of how important is culture uh, when policy is made and, and basically in protocol? And maybe you can tell us an anecdote or a story where you saw this in action. Oh, absolutely. I mean, culture, that, that, that was really, I have to say, Susan, the core of what I wanted to share um, in my book was, you know, the importance of understanding um, global cultural differences. Oh, we are seeing today around the world how um, uh, you know difference creates fear in people. Difference creates um, animosities, anger, um, and and people are hesitant to reach across and and extend that hand. If we would eliminate that through a um, through understanding, through curiosity, um, doing our homework, taking a moment to ask a few questions, um, we just would function better. Function better as a global society, uh, and that really is the case in in my government service. I took that to to core to heart that. 
uh, my duty was to make sure that the president understood the secretary of state and all the diplomats, frankly, that served at the State Department uh, in the administration understood those cultural nuances because that's really the power of protocol. It's those micro details, it's those nuances that can make an enormous difference. Greeting someone in the appropriate fashion, um, uh, saying a word in their language, a, a greeting in their language, um, you know, hola, it goes a long way. It really does. People feel respected. They feel this, there's sort of that moment of where they they take it back and and then they they feel just so honored uh, by the fact that you have engaged them in this way. And then going beyond that, understanding color differences, um, uh, attire differences, all of that makes such an enormous difference when you are trying to make those critical connections and particularly in diplomacy. What we're doing is we are investing in these relationships and when you invest in a relationship, one way of doing that is by showing respect. And when you are showing respect, what you're trying to do is develop a trust with that person. And once you have a trust with that person, wow, the opportunities are endless. They're just endless. And so you're going to get into, in particular in diplomacy, some sticky wickets, difficult situations. And because now you can lean on that trusted relationship, one that you developed over time, uh, it, it can take you a long way. I felt the same way when I was interviewing uh, all these leaders for my own book that once they trusted me, the stories they shared uh, were much more intimate and personal. So uh, trust and diplomacy, they go hand in hand and there is no diplomacy without trust. Mm -mm. Uh, speaking of which, uh, you write in your book that beyond the practical purpose of etiquette, lies a hidden world of communication and leverage. Like an emoji, etiquette is a code that transmits intention and feeling. So well-executed etiquette in government, business, and personal relationships can influence dealings and open doors. So Capricia, has there been a time when you or a client has made a mistake in etiquette? And what are some of those lessons learned? Oh boy, do I have some stories I could tell you, Susan. <laughs> um, well, you know, let me first just say that, you know, etiquette provides an, a, a, a sort of laying the groundwork of expectations. How should everyone interact? It's a, it's a roadmap for behavior, like protocol. I mean, etiquette is, is seamlessly interwined with protocol. Uh, it helps uh, make those connections that we're trying to desperately attain so much easier. Um, it can you know, always in, in engaging in proper etiquette. It can make sure that, you know, when you are caught in a sticky situation, you can land in a better place. Um, and if you, if you get it wrong, which I've seen happen quite a few times, uh, etiquette and protocol, um, it, can, it can cause confusion or worse yet, it could come across as seeming like it's, you are intentionally trying to put someone into a bad place or embarrass them. And that is the worst of all when you're engaging in, in diplomacy or engaging with a client in a negotiation or even with, you know, the school PTA. I mean, you want to be um, as transparent as possible, but by knowing these etiquette rules, by, by feeling comfortable and they are then second nature to you, your behavior is in accordance with what you're trying to achieve. Um, I have to say probably the worst example that I've, I've seen, and, and regrettably I've seen it multiple times, is overindulgence. And when someone is at a business meeting or a business dinner party, there's that, that one person um, who just had one too many. And um, there was an occasion where at one of the hotels actually here in Washington, DC, um, a guest was being confrontational with um, a member of the diplomatic corps. Oh, and no. I stepped in because they were very uncomfortable. They were trying so very hard to be respectful and, and disengage. But that person just kept talking about a political issue in their country and attacking them and their voice was loud. And so at that moment, 
you call security and you allow the professionals to step in and extricate the person from the situation. Now, were they mortified? Of course they were mortified. Um, but, um, you know, in those, in those moments when someone loses all perspective of social conduct, appropriate social conduct, you have to remove that from, from the event, from the, 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 their seat at the table. They no longer get a seat at the table. They no longer get a seat at the table. Uh, I, I sometimes think that maybe families uh, during the holiday seasons, which they had security to take out those uncles or aunts that have a few too many too. But uh, I know we have some questions from the audience right now, and I, I'd love to ask you a few. Uh, and this comes from uh, Michael Aiken. Uh, he says, Ambassador Marshall, years ago, you hosted a wonderful reception for cultural tourism DC at the Blair House. As the world opens up back for travel at some point, what role do you see for travel and cultural exchange in helping further the much needed understanding? Well, let me first say this to you, Michael, and I'm so glad you enjoyed that event because we so enjoyed putting it on. Um, it really was wonderful and what a great partner. I mean, just phenomenal partner. Um, I, I, although I am ready to break out of my house and, and begin to travel extensively, I can't wait until I can do that. I must say this, that our now, our ability to visit, see, engage with people virtually because we, we all had to adapt to these platforms has brought us new opportunities, just terrific opportunities. I, I am sure there are people on this platform right now who are from other countries. And I'm, I'm pleased to welcome you to our, our, our virtual United States of America. Um, at some point, you'll have to go to the Reagan building and, and, and check it out and we'll have an event there. Um, but it, it just offers this, these conversations that but for we would have never had. And I've been doing them more and more these days. So I'm very excited about the one consequence that may come from the pandemic um, and, and being forced into the virtual space is that we are more globally connected. As long as you have some really good Wi-Fi, um, you are you are do, going to do okay. Um, but when we do re-engage, I I think that the, well, economists are saying that we are going to get on planes and we are going to go to restaurants and we are going back to museums and we are going to re-engage, but with such vigor, they are seeing a, a global boom in economies because people are so excited about that human to human contact. There is nothing more important than that human to human touch point. When, um, when we meet someone, I call it thin slicing. We love those like first few moments of that great, who are they about? What are they about? We're all dying to do that again. And, um, and so, yeah, I think that um, when we re-engage, we're going to have tremendous opportunities. And I see a few questions on that note about COVID. Uh, Mary Watts, uh, she adores you and you've inspired her to work uh, towards becoming a foreign service officer. And she's asking about uh, being diplomacy being affected in the long run by the changes from COVID uh, for small gatherings, Zoom meetings, and more remote work. And in addition to that, uh, uh, Maria asks uh, that your opinion about the, the new COVID era protocols and etiquette and being forced to implement these. How are these changes going to affect diplomacy? And, and will there ever be going back to the way it was? Well, Mary Watts, I absolutely adore you too. Um, I, I want to say that. And I'm so excited that uh, you're going on to become a, um, uh, a, a, a government servant and that you are you know, planning on going into the foreign service. That is just tremendous, just really exciting. Um, it, it's a, I, 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 I do understand that over the past few years, there was actually a decrease in the number and we need so many people who are, um, who want to go into this field and service around the world. So thank you, 
um, and, and good luck. Uh, you know, I, there are new protocols um, for engaging and, um, and that it's going to be with us for some time. And some, you know, I've, I've listened to Sanjay Gupta and Dr. Fauci, I, you know, three times, four times a day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're advising us that this is, this is not short term, this is long term. And so we have to adapt. And that's the wonderful thing about our, our humanity is that we are also, well, most of us are quite adaptable. And, um, and in particular, our social codes of conduct can be adapted now for uh, these new environments. What I, what I say again and again in my book is, you know, ask, it's, it's always ask for permission. Um, when, when you're attending a social event, inquire in advance. What are those protocols? What what am I? What should I know? Is it mask? Is it no mask? Are we outside? Are we inside? How many people will be in attendance? When you're extending an invitation, make sure that you give people the comfort of information. You know, um, make sure that they know uh, there will be extra masks on hand. We this event will be outside. We will only have this number of people in attendance. People just need reassurances uh, during this time of COVID. Um, I've seen now quite a few people have gone back to handshaking. You know, I think that for the time being, the elbow and the fist. Um, I'm not even quite quite there on the fist. I'm I'm still stuck at the elbow. Um, is um is should probably still be adhered to. But again, um, you know, we, we don't want to cause offense to people if they're coming in with a hand or with a fist. Um, I shake it and then I find some sanitizer very very quickly <laughs> and I sanitize. I have my mother who lives with me and she's elderly. So I have to take extra precautions and people have those, those issues in their lives. Overall, we just still need to remain understanding and compassionate for one another. People are managing and dealing with um, the pandemic in their own personal way. And so in pushing them to, to do things at a time when they're not, they still don't feel comfortable is, um, it's just not appropriate. Um, it's not appropriate etiquette. And, and we should give people their, their time and, and, and ability to manage it in, in their own way. And we'll see what the next era of diplomacy post COVID will be. But uh, grace is uh, definitely needed for everyone in this and there's another question from an audience member who was the woman who kicked off uh, the series, Ambassador Swanee Hunt, who adores you as well. Uh, she has asked, uh, well, she's made a statement and then a question. So I'm, I'm going to read it out to the audience because it's an interesting point. Uh, there are many heads of state plus heads of government and monarchs. And the US is one of the only countries where the first two are combined, which is really too bad, uh, she says, because countries want to have their prime minister and their president meet with the president of the United States. And as an ambassador, uh, she was the person trying to do those invitations. So she says, Capricia, how on earth did you manage that? And how did you choose which uh, the prime minister or president would get the appointment? And is there any difference between how men and women dealt with that issue? Hmm. Well, Ambassador Hunt, it is such a pleasure to um, virtually be with you. I, um, I was in awe of her service. She was and is still known as one of the greatest ambassadors that the United States has ever had. Um, You're here. She really is, and um, and I fondly recall traveling uh, with sec with then First Lady Hillary Clinton, and um, having wonderful meals at uh, her residence, and and um, and engaging in um, cultural um, uh, visits and a bit of social downtime with the ambassador. She just was a tremendous representative um, of our country. Uh, you know, I, I frankly don't select, I didn't have input on president or prime minister, it was the NSC. And as you know, that oftentimes in-, for, the, in for those who don't know the NSC, National Security oh. 
helpful, right? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Sorry about that. I slip into those acronyms. Ugh, DC insider speak. Yes. <laughs> I um so so they they would make the decision, but oftentimes in a country, the president can be seen as a figurehead and 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 in a, in acts in a more ceremonial capacity, whereas the prime minister is the head of government. And so oftentimes you will see um, an invitation for a state visit would be extended to the president of that country because it was a was seen as more of a ceremonial activity, whereas the bilateral then will take place with um, with the prime minister and their delegations. Um, when the pre when President Obama, for instance, traveled to the United Kingdom um, at the invitation of Her Majesty the Queen for a state visit, the visit aspects. Um, the ceremonial aspects of that visit rather were um, in, in attendance with Her Majesty. But then the president, President Obama went to 10 Downing Street to engage in more uh, bilaterals on policy and um, official business uh, with Prime Minister Cameron. Mm -hmm. And there isn't a difference between men and women. I didn't see any difference in the um, in the selections uh, and in the outcomes. Interesting. Well, we have another uh, question from the audience that is very timely. It comes from Ambassador Suzanne Johnson Cook. Uh, have there been any women of color in your role? And who were your cultural interpreters as you visited black countries? And, and lastly, uh, what is the engagement with the Association of Black American Ambassadors? Uh, because we're talking about not only a seat at the table, but also diversity at the table, diversity of thought. And we have to uh, bring folks to the table that represent America. And so uh, tell us a little bit more about what that was like. I could not agree more with the ambassador that we need a pipeline. And it's very, very important. And um, I think that, you know, as they, as, we all work towards creating a, a more direct um, pipeline and one that people actually know that they know exists. Oftentimes at state, um, you know, people just didn't know about these jobs. They weren't aware of, of various positions and opportunities unless you were sort of in the know, if you will, and you already had to be there. Um, people were passing them down to people that they, they, they brought in um, from the Foreign Service. So we have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do um, at state and in the Foreign Service. And I'm so glad that she is taking that, taking that upon herself. Um, the, the first um, chief of protocol of color was a Latino under um, um, Albla, oh my gosh, I always get his, you know, we call him Albi, but um, is his name um, wrong, Ablarlo. He uh, worked for, pre for um, President Carter and um, and then I was the second. So um, there have not been there there have not been any African American chiefs of protocol. Um, there have been African American uh, social secretaries, um, and I certainly hope that um, you know we begin to create a, a broader and and many more opportunities um, for young people to uh, learn about this position so that um, we can have more people of diversity um, to be included uh, in the office of protocol because it's it's representative of who we are. And I think it's so, so important. You know, standing there as a, you know, first generation American meant the world to me. And, and knowing that um, my families, both in Mexico and Croatia would look and watch and see me on TV in awe, just saying, oh my gosh, that's, that's, you know, our capricia. And, and we need more of that. We need more of, of like, who we are and what we represent of our country. So um, I I'm with you. Let me know how I can help. 100%, 100%. And if anyone wants to get in touch with Capricia, uh, one, she's on various social media platforms, but two, go to her website, capriciamarshall.com and uh, you can 
contact her via her website if you want to speak more about a few different issues. We have a question coming from Atlanta, Georgia. Stanley asks, what was one of the most valuable pieces of advice that anyone gave you before you became chief of protocol? Oh, um, one of the most valuable pieces of advice um, probably came from one of my predecessors, Lucky Roosevelt. Lucky served um, with great distinction during the Reagan years. Um, she, like myself, did not really know uh, the president she was about to serve. So she did not really know President Reagan. Um, I um, was new, sort of knew of President Obama, but I did not have that intimate relationship that many chiefs have um, with their with their president. So um, what she had said to me is, do your homework, which is something that I, I live by, but do your homework because you want him to turn to you at every corner with a prepared advice. You know, you need to know at a moment what the right thing for him to do is. Don't um and uh and wait and let me go find out, but be ready with that answer. And so I'm a, I, my, my heart kind of flipped a little bit when thinking, oh my goodness, I've got to know everything in the world about everyone in the world. No pressure, um, no pressure. No pressure at all. But it was it was intense and it was great advice because she was absolutely right. Those instances arose, and um, you know the president would just give a look, and I would I'd be right there. Okay, yes, sir. Here, this is what you need to do. And then also, he became to depend upon. He he began to depend upon me. Uh, right before he would go out for an event, he would stop, and you know he's like six, I don't know, six giant, six three or so. And uh, you know, and I, I I still couldn't see eye to eye with him with my three and a half inch heels. And I would just look up at him and I'd say, sir, okay, this is what we have to do. And he's like, okay, Capricia, give me the one, two, three. And he wanted to know that. And I so appreciated that, that our relationship grew where he really wanted to make sure that there wasn't the, he would not commit any faux pas that was going to divert attention away from the policy matters at hand. We've seen it happen. And I'm sorry, you know, in the last administration, it really did happen quite a bit. Um, you know, one of the, I think personally, one of the gravest was when um, the president saluted a general from another country. A, our president never salutes military of another country, and B, um, we certainly don't salute the military of a country that we don't recognize. And so everyone was focused on that moment. They were not focused on the issues at hand. The fact that he is trying to repair this broken relationship, I mean, it was an enormous endeavor. That's what we want to be watching. That's what we need to see. So that's what I really appreciate that President Obama and President Clinton, when I served him as social secretary, both would come to me and say, what do I need to know? And, and Lucky's advice was great. Know it all. <laughs> right, and protocol, diplomacy and etiquette, look, it's nonpartisan. Uh, so every administration benefits from following these, these rules essentially. Uh, because that's why the rules are there to make it easier so people are comfortable meeting and greeting, working on hard issues, and that there's a protocol to follow. And, and speaking of which, Prisha, I loved learning about your five smart rules you've used uh, with your team. And you've shared these five smart rules that have led you to success in international business etiquette in your book. However, can you tell our audience, what are these five smart rules? And what's the number one mistake people make with them? <laughs> well, we talked a little bit about um, the first one already, but you know, I I, I adhere to these because um, they're they're icebreakers. They're ways of making that instant, as I said, that thin slicing moment. You can make that sort of great in that instant first impression, good first impression. And so um, that, you know, I've, I've followed them. I suggest them to the people who I work with. And so far they seem to have, um, they've all be, seemed to benefit from them, but shake S, it's, you know, smart, S-M-A-R-T, of course, uh, shake hands. Um, you know, this of course was written pre-COVID, right? So, um, right, right. <laughs> but we're going to be shaking hands again. And some people are already shaking hands again. Um, you know, 
making sure that you do that, but uh, extend the hand, make sure that it is firm. Um, make sure you look each other in the eye because you want to make that critical connection with that person, but don't let it linger too long. Three seconds is good enough. Um, and then, of course, there are differences and variations, as I discussed, uh, around the world. And knowing those differences, so, so, so important, a great advantage. I call them power pivots, a moment when you, you, you feel, when you extend that respect to your counterpart and they sense and they feel it, then you say, aha, okay, now I can engage. It's really important. Um, meeting and greeting like a pro, um, know people's titles before you walk in, um, greet in president's order so that you're meeting and greeting with the CEO first and then down the pecking order. And this happens to all of us. There's a name that we should know and that we just can't um, remember it. And so the best thing to do is ask politely, you know, ask again, uh, please remind me of what your name is as opposed to bumbling through and making someone feel uncomfortable. And then when you're greeting people, stand uh, to shake their hand um, when they're walking into the room. Acing elevators and doors. I have seen so many awkward moments of where people are walking through a door. You've got two leaders and they're like, oh, you go first. No, you go first. No, you, please. I insist. No, no, you. And, every, and we're like, we will be here all day long. And so making sure that you sort of pre-stage it of who's going to go through where, but for us regular folks, hold the door, common courtesy. And if a man is holding a door for me, I just say, thank you. It's not a marriage proposal. It is a door. And they're being very kind. Um, restricting interruptions. Urgh. This can, can just decimate an opportunity, a relationship. Um, you know, leaving your phone out and it just starts ringing during a business meeting. It's on top of a table at a business lunch and it says, this is more important than you are right now. There's a lot of, con there's a lot of hidden messaging in, in the way that we manage our phones. Put the phone out down in your lap have it on vibrate. If you are expecting a port and call, let that person know. If you'll excuse me, I might receive a call. My mother's in the hospital, blah, 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 blah. Person totally understands, but just give them a little advance notice of that. The pop-in. Oh my goodness. Oh, I remember working in, um, you know, ages ago, two years ago, of course, pre-COVID in the office space where, um, you know, people would just say, I hope I'm not bothering you. Well, now you just did. You know, send a text, a message, instant message, and just say, I'd like to come by, would now be convenient for you. Giving someone a moment to have a break in their work or their thought process. Um, those are really, really important. And, you know, T, lastly, thank people and do the follow up. Be that gracious host, escort someone after a meeting to the elevator, be the gracious guest, and make sure that you send a note, handwritten preferably after the meeting. And these days I am astonished at this whole concept of ghosting, that when someone sends an email to you, if you just really don't wanna deal with it, you just stop replying, well, that's rude. And frankly, um, you know that can come back to bite you because in the future, if you really need to have that relationship, that connection with that person, they may ghost you back. So- uh, Right, you never know. That's right, that's right. So I, you know, those are my smart rules. <laughs> I highly suggest uh, getting the book and highlighting that section. I put multiple stickers on that section. So great rules to work and live by. And we have two questions from the audience. Uh, Jackie and Olivia asked this, actually. Uh, Jackie is a master's in international relations graduate student. And uh, Olivia is asking a similar question as well, but do you have any advice for those starting their career uh, and trying to get in the field of international relations during the pandemic? And, and what counsel do you have for young women uh, in education? How do they aspire to work in the foreign service? Mm. So I'd love to know what age they are um, now, if they're in college or at the, the beginning it seems of uh, undergrad and graduate students. Yeah, we'll okay. go with that oh, range. Terrific. Then intern, get those internships, fellowship positions. They are plentiful at the State Department. It gives you tremendous opportunity to connect with so many different individuals. Um, additionally, uh, because they're just so shorthanded, I mean, I know I was, uh, at state, 
that they give you so much really important work to do. You're not getting someone coffee. You're not making copies. You are drafting briefs. You are going, you're uh, um, doing a lot of research. Um, you're heading with them on the meeting because they need to have a note taker. Um, there's so, there's just wonderful opportunities. Um, you have to apply early though. So don't wait until January, they'll be gone. You have to start off in the fall and, and, and go digging and hunting around um, on the website for them. But there are so many wonderful opportunities um, that are at the State Department. And oftentimes some of those positions even go unfilled. Um, alternatively, I would say, go to a think tank. I'm associated with the Atlanta Council, which is phenomenal. Uh, Fred Kemp is our, is our president and really invested in the interns so much so that um, they pay their interns at the Atlanta Council. We're uh, here. That's great. <laughs> right? Yes. Um, and uh, there's quite a few of them. They're very competitive positions. But again, um, we have so many different centers there that you get uh, a great deal of opportunity to um, um, have an experience from each of those centers. Additionally, there's lots of former government officials that work at think tanks, and they love like myself, to talk about their experiences and how they can help you. Um, we're always wanting to reach down and pull up uh, um, awesome people. But let me tell you this also, ladies, find a great mentor. Mentorship is so incredibly important and undervalued. Uh, I was blessed. I had Hillary Clinton in my life. And, um, you know, once she took a, this much interest, I kind of latched on and didn't let go. Uh, so, but, but, you know, she stood it up, she stood on a higher branch than I did. And she could see great opportunities for me. And she always did. She invested in me. She, you know, gave me um, her valued judgment on, on big issues. Um, but I also had worked hard. I, I was hungry. I wanted more. And she knew that. I was very clear about my objectives with her. And so um, when you find a, a mentor who wants to uh, be a part of your life and, and help you move forward and along, um, you know, you have a tremendous partner. And um, so I would say, you know, f find someone. It doesn't have to be a woman. Uh, it can be a man as well, um, or you can have multiple, I did, um, mentors as, a, in your life. So um, I, I, I would also really suggest that. I highly recommend having mentors too. And when I, when I interviewed women for this book, the one you see behind me, uh, all of them said, hey, let this book serve as a mentorship guide. And I say the same about Capricia's book, that if you don't have high ranking connections, that's okay. Get these books and these are your mentorship guides. They really do tell stories of how to succeed and the ways to do it. And so right here, we're offering you mentors right now. In addition to that, if you want to get in touch with me on LinkedIn, I am happy to talk with you. Check me out on LinkedIn and Capricia's on LinkedIn too. We'd be happy to connect with you uh, and, and hear more of your story and see how we can help you. Uh, we have uh, many questions from the audience and I know we are getting close to on the hour. So. I'm going to ask in rapid fire one question, Capricia, and then another. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, this question comes from a dear friend, uh, Lena Omar, who is with the Iraqi Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Ambassador Omar asks uh, to Capricia, what are your countries you visited in the Middle East? And what are your top three pieces of advice for uh, the head of protocol? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Ambassador, for that. I have. Um... I, you know, I, I think I've just about visited most countries except for Bahrain, Oman, and Kuwait. And I would so want to go. Um, and they were all, 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 most of my visits were always on official business. So when, you know, the secretary would go, when the presidents would go, because I traveled with both President Clinton and President Obama, um, you know, uh, they would generally go to several countries. And so it was always exciting to me to see where we were going to go. I love the Middle East. I love the culture of the Middle East, um, the dates and the, and the wonderful tea, the mint tea that you would get upon arrival. It just sets that tone. You know, let's get to know one another. Um, I'm sorry, Susan, the, 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 the latter part of her question was, I was so caught up in myself. 
Yes, no, we were thinking about where you've been. Uh, if you could offer some advice to folks in that position of chief of protocol, what would be maybe your number one piece of advice if they're stepping into that role of chief of protocol? Right. I, uh, for, for, I will talk about generally, but for the Middle East, I have to say that the chiefs of protocol that I met there, extraordinary, extraordinary, incredibly buttoned up. Um, Ambassador Geneva of the UAE, bar none, one of the best. Um, you know, uh, my dear friend, he's now left the post, but he was in Jordan. Amazing. Um, he got me the best kanafa I've ever had in my life. Oh, wait a minute. I'm supposed to say that that comes from Nablus in Palestine, but it was really good in Jordan too. Um, but you know, they were, they're, they work hard. It's an institution. I think for those who really want to get into this position, then um, you should get, you should understand events. You should sincerely read my book. Um, you should read Susan's book. You should, um, but also then, uh, as I had suggested before, find ways to get into um, your uh, foreign ministries, whether it's the State Department in the US or anywhere around the world to, um, learn a little bit more about the functionings of the office. In many, um, it, in, in many countries, it is a, a foreign service career position. It's not political. In the US, it is political. It is a political appointment by the president. So it, it, it varies. It's different in different places around the world. So um, for those, it's more official. I would figure out that track that um, can lead you can lead you there. For those here in the US, um, work on a presidential campaign that finally ends up winning and, um, and, and, and put forth to presidential personnel that you really wanna work uh, in the office of protocol. And one last question, we're, we're almost there. And one last question, so many questions coming in. And this comes from also another dear friend, Ambassador Thelma Philip Brown from St. Kitts and Neves, who's in my book. Uh, and she says, Ambassador Marshall, uh, the Experience America program is a wonderful program. Thank you for spearheading it. Uh, and she also notes that the pandemic has shown that women in leadership have managed their countries uh, amazingly and perhaps even better than others, right? Uh, and the percentage of women in leadership still remains low. So final question, how do we get past that? How do we get more women to support women for leadership? Well, quite interesting that um, the percentages of women that, um, that vote for men over female candidates. Uh, you know, it, I, I worked on a paper at the Atlantic Council that focused on Latin America, where in many of those countries, they have quotas, it works. Um, people don't like quotas, but um, it gets women into the game. And once they're in the game, as Christine Lagarde says, once you get your foot in the door, you can open that door wider and you can bring more women through with you. Um, it's really, really important. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not sure uh, why there aren't more female leaders. Um, I watched Jacinda Ardern, Prime Minister of New Zealand, and, and how she's led her country throughout this pandemic, and it has been brilliant. Um, she has used several very important tools, uh, empathy. Um, she has she sat down on those first few days um, in a Facebook discussion with her country and, and talked about the pandemic and what was, um, what was happening and what to expect and created that relationship with them, that bond with them, I know how you feel moment, and then collaborated with them on we are in this together and moving it all forward. You know, during those times, I think that she and, and Angela Merkel and, and other uh, female leaders, they understand it was a human moment. We had to connect with our people and, and move them forward. So why we don't have more women ruling the world, I just don't know, but hopefully we will get there. And if you check out our books, you can see how we can do that and how we can reach for gender parity. Well, uh, Ambassador Marshall, uh, Capricia, this was an amazing conversation. We could go for so much longer. Thank you for being here. Uh, and a special thank you to the World Trade Center in Washington, DC, Dublin, and Webport Global. And thank you to our audience. Continue this conversation with us online. If you use the hashtag seat at the table, hashtag where leaders lead, both hashtags, we will check it out and engage with you online. And don't worry, if you miss part of the program, you're in luck. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on YouTube on the YouTube channel of the Reagan Building, an international trade center within about a week. So check back in about a week and you can see the recording. Now, 
a special invitation for you. We invite you to join us for the rest of our series, A Seat at the Table, Women in Global Leadership. I'll be in conversation with Her Royal Highness Ambassador Rima from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia on May 25th. Mark your calendars, May 25th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. You don't wanna miss this conversation. Thank you again for joining us. I'm Susan Sloan and you have a seat at the table.